Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California and to today's discussion about today's AAPI women. I'm John Zipporah, the club's vice president of media and editorial. Now at the Commonwealth Club, we're continuing to produce hundreds of programs a year on a wide variety of issues, online as well as in-person programs. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for more upcoming programs, as well as video and audio from past events. If you're watching us live on YouTube, add your questions to the YouTube chat box and we'll work them into our discussion here today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of the Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors. Good to see you, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us for our special AAPI Heritage Month programming at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm deeply honored to introduce you our two speakers today. They're well respected in their community, but also they're sheroes of mine, and I followed their work very closely. And while we talk about you know, what it means to us uh, as AAPI women, what we mean to ourselves, I think they both are symbolic of how we come together and really create peaceful, harmonious communities. And so our first speaker today is Council Member Shang Tao, who's Oakland City Council President Pro Tem, the first Hmong American woman council member in California history. She's currently Council President Pro Tem and chairs the Rules and Legislation Committee. Council Member Tao is also president of the League of California Cities API Caucus and has served on boards for the Redwood Heights Association and Oakland Asian Cultural Center. She's an Oakland mayoral candidate. We also have Dr. Connie, Connie One, who's the executive director and co-founder of AAPI Women Lead. And as a part of her work in ending racial and gender-based violence, she leads national research projects on race, gender, and violence. Welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this program. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having us. Thank you, Michelle. So I thought we'd, we'd uh, share, you know, we'd begin by sharing a time when it became clear to both of you that you are an Asian American woman. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we have this understanding that our experiences are unique. And at times the issues that we face are very much nuanced and particular to us as Asian American women, as immigrant, as other. We'll have Dr. Wan begin. Oh, that's such a good question, Michelle. Um, and again, thank you for inviting us to come and speak with you for this month. Um, you know, it's, I thought about this question and I think it's multifold. Uh, I think growing up as the child of refugees um, from the war in Vietnam, I had a pretty strong recollection that I was um, being otherized or othered as I was growing up. Um, two things that come to mind. One is my mother was very adamant about us speaking Vietnamese in the home. Uh, my mom was constantly asking me to translate that into Vietnamese, say this in Vietnamese, don't lose your language, don't lose your language. She was really fearful around this concept of losing your culture and losing your language. And I think for her, that comes from her own, or rather my family's legacy of growing up as, um, you know, fighting colonialism. Uh, you know, it was very big for our, for my family in Vietnam to remain and, and keep our language. Um, but that came into conflict with growing up here in the U.S., where I had to constantly translate for my family, um, my grandparents in particular. You know, I'm, I'm translating for them at the Social Security office, at the doctor's office, at the supermarket. And mind you, I'm four years old, five years old, struggling to figure out how to maintain a language and then figure out this new language that no one really understood at home. Um, and I think those um, conflicts and that, that uh, desire to figure out multiple identities at the same time uh, led me to really um, want to figure out what it meant to be Asian in America. I think those were primary for me. And then also growing up working class, poor, um, in the Bay Area and facing a lot of circumstances that I didn't see other communities experiencing was also a moment of clarity for me um, as a Vietnamese woman um, and as an Asian person growing up here in the U.S. Council Member Cal. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I think that my experience overlaps a lot with Dr. Wan. Um, 
you know, growing up, my family, we were the only API family at the elementary school. And so uh, my mom would cook really great food that we all loved, but we were not you know, we didn't take it to school because we knew the students would tease us about how it looked, how it smelled. Um, I'm really thrilled that I'm able to raise my kids here in the Bay Area in Oakland where they can take their school uh, their food um, from home to school and people are enjoying it with them. And so, you know, I think that was like the very beginning of like this, you are different, you know, you are different and somehow uh, different is you know, uh, not good in other people's eyes. And so growing up in that kind of environment, um, you know, it really closed off, you know, my family, myself, but then you get into, you know, adulthood and you get all these stereotypes of like Asian women being meek, not strong leaders, you know, and then when you are outspoken and somehow you're uh, not, you know, doing what good Asian women are supposed to do, you know, and even culturally within uh, the Hmong culture as well, too. And so, you know, as a politician, what I've realized and what I have seen, and it is true, is that even within our API community, uh, our API men are treated a lot different in, than our API women in politics, right? And let's just talk about a little bit about I don't know, fundraising, for example, like we are seeing that our API men will be uh, given a lot more funds for their campaign because they are seen as more legitimate for whatever reason. Um, and even if you are the front runner or you are a very legitimate candidate, uh, you have to, the, you know, the, the poll in which like the goalpost in which is placed upon you, it's a lot further. You have to like go far and beyond just to reach that gold post. And it's just not within the API community, it's layers, right? It's within the political environment in itself as well too. And so you have to deal with it at a general level and you have to also deal with it in a more micro level within your own API community. And I think this is why we're seeing a lot of API women getting together. I know that in the world of politics, um, a lot of the API women in politics are banding together nationwide to start these conversation and to come together to support each other. Both of your experiences and talking about being Asian American and othered, I mean, it's just uh, it pretty much a page out of my diary, <laughs> especially reading the mail. I still read the mail for her mom. And so I know exactly, you know, what that is like. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, I mentioned it earlier, you're both heroes of mine, and I read every day about your work. And I try to apply that to my community, right? Like, we are learning from each other. And so why don't um, we also have you talk about your work? We'll start with Dr. One, talk about, uh, you know, the organization that you founded over four years ago, and why? You know, and I, I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear you say that it resonates, Michelle um, and Councilmember Shang. You know, the story of just figuring it out <laughs> um, is so deeply embedded. And I think our uh, politics and I think our um, kind of upbringings here in the United States um, for AAPI Women Lead, which, you know, we became uh, an organization or a formal organization about four and a half years ago. Uh, and it came about from my work, which has been about 20 something years in fighting and resisting and trying to end racial and gender violence. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons it's because it's been a part of my upbringing and my um, work for decades. And then it was also um, pretty clear that we needed to make it into an organization because my sister, who was the other co-founder, she was in corporate America and found herself experiencing a lot of sexual harassment. She found herself experiencing, uh, you know, men who would say things to her um, like, you know, I, I, I hear you're Vietnamese. I, um, I can't wait to go to Vietnam and maybe marry a, a, a wife. Right. And say these things that were quite offensive um, and then not have any form of accountability at her workplace for this. And so she asked me, you know, knowing that I had been doing research for a long time, was a community organizer and advocate, especially around gender based violence. She said, well, I think we need your help and I think we need to do something because these other settings don't have the support um, and may not know how to organize or create change in the workplace. 
And so we created APA Women Lead based upon these various experiences. And I think it's also important that our organization is very grounded in transformative justice politics. We are an organization that works to end racial and gender violence against Asian and Pacific Islander women, girls, non-binary communities. Uh, we are led by survivors, we're led by non-binary communities, Asian femmes, we're led by our community partners, Pacific Islanders, uh, Native Hawaiians, and a lot of our work is around um, community accountability, right? We, uh, we host a couple of different programs. One is our mutual aid programs. We understand that our most vulnerable communities, including our unhoused, our sex workers, our immigrant communities, our elders are most impacted by the violence that has been going on um, during this period. And so we host mutual aid campaigns, right? We host um, community research. We just launched the an unprecedented research project that is national. There are 11 organizations that are part of this um, all across the country, including American Samoa, Hawaii, um, Atlanta, and we're leading the first research project that is collecting our community stories around racial and gender violence from our communities, narratives, and perspectives. That's a part of the work that we do in addition to community um, safety, healing justice, right? And we did all of this because we know how much our community needs support. We also have an event um, that we host every year, which we're actually hosting this year. Uh, it's called Hashtag I'm Ready. So we're having our fifth annual Hashtag I'm Ready 2022 event, October 28th, October 29th, and our first annual gala. And all of that usually has about 300 people coming to learn about violence, healing, and um, social transformation. Uh, and again, that's all because we've been you know, otherized. And uh, for our organization, it's about reclaiming our histories, our identities, and our powers um, for social change. Thank you so much. And Council Member Tao, I mean, making history, right? First Hmong American woman to council, to be council member in California, but getting into politics, we'd love to hear, you know, kind of your road and, and your why. Why, um, run for office? Why become an elected leader? Thank you so much for that, Michelle. I just want to say that um, Dr. Conning Wan is so amazing. Uh, I look up to her, her courageousness, and uh, I just know that AAPI Women Lead has done such great work. So I just wanted to give kudos where kudos is owed to and uh, just paving the way. Uh, I know that for so long, women or API women's voices, is in, you know, it has been invisible. And so for you to do this work to really uplift and kind of like, you know, take away all the stigma of our lived experiences and saying like, look, we go through it too. And it's okay to speak about it. We can be in sisterhood together. And I think that that's just so important. Um, but going back to this and, and the reason why, and it wraps around to like my story as well too, Dr. Wan, is that I am a single mother, right? And so when I was a single mother trying to put my life together, you know, getting all the different pieces because I fled a really brutal domestic violence relationship. I mean, I was, you know, six months pregnant. He just grabbed me by the hair, pulled me down and started still kicking me in my, uh, my six month pregnant stomach. <clears throat> So for me, it was, was really life-saving in, in regards to having my son because I couldn't leave that relationship for myself uh, for, for whatever reason, right? And, um, and, I, and remember, I'm a tough gal <laughs> and I've always been. I'm, I'm the rebellious um, uh, child who said, you know, I'm breaking the patriarchy. Even when I was a very young age where I'm not getting up to cook and clean if my brothers don't cook and clean. And yet I found myself in this relationship. And so it can happen to just anybody. And, um, you know, after that situation happened, I, I took off and I was just so embarrassed because of all this negative stigma around DV, especially in the API community and within the Hmong community. And so I just assumed that my family wouldn't take me back because I somehow in my head, I felt like I had chosen, you know, my abuser over my family for so many years. And so, you know, that led to me being homeless, um, living in my vehicle. I had my son at County uh, Hospital in Martinez, California. Um, no one came to visit, but we had the nurses there were taking care of me, teaching me how to like take care of my baby. I was 21. And it's, you know, that's like another sign of like how 
community helps. I mean, they came and I was couch surfing and they would follow me to wherever I was to really check in on me, you know, every other day. Um, it's through community who were knitting blankets and, uh, and beanies for babies, you know, um, uh, our seniors who were donating to the hospital. I mean, I still have that to this day. And I endeavor to find those people who created that because it meant so much to me in a time of need. But falling, going into politics was just kind of honestly an accident. An accident in the sense that I went to Merritt College to try to do better, uh, to, to you know be sufficient financially and uh, be able to support my son. And from Merritt College, I was actually supported through uh, many of my teachers saying that I can do it, right? Having other people believe in me before I was able to even believe in myself. And so I did graduate from Merritt College here in the city of Oakland as valedictorian and then transferred to Cal. And then again, Cal opened up so many resources to me in regards to being a student parent. There were many other student parents and those are now my lifetime friends. Uh, our kids grew up together and it, it was just a very supportive environment. Um, the year before I graduated, I was, you know, my whole trajectory was go to law school and, um, you know, I, I couldn't afford to actually buy my son any clothes and he was outgrowing his clothes. And so I was looking for a paid internship, a stipend paid internship for the summer. And I found an organization that got APIs into uh, local government uh, to try to improve, you know, the number of people that are in local government, the number of APIs. And so I was paired up with Councilwoman Rebecca Kaplan uh, during this time. And I just, it opened up a whole new world to me because as a daughter of refugees myself, like you only know what you know. And remember, we're teaching as daughters of refugees, we're teaching our parents, you know, how it's done here in the United States, we're teaching them. And so they didn't teach me or in the, my, the public schools that I went to did not teach me too much about what local government actually does, like how it operates and what it actually, how it functioned. Mind you, I'm now at UC Berkeley and I'm still learning all of this, right? Which we should probably learn uh, in grade school. And um, what I realized was that all the representatives who were at the decision-making table, all the people that were uh, in those seats, they didn't have the lived experience. They were learning about my life lived experience through books, through anecdotal stories or what have you. And I just thought that was the craziest thing. But then I didn't say, oh me, I wanna run for office. It was just, I just wanna be a staffer and like whisper things into the politician's ear. And after um, being a staffer for about four years, uh, I was able to work closely with community. And you know, it was actually, again, community who believed in me before I believed in myself, because I never saw myself as a politician because in my head, politicians were more whiter <laughs> and more um, had money or came from money. And me, I was on social services, right? I'm on CalWORKs and I'm a single mom. And even my mom, when I, when I finally decided, okay, I'm gonna throw my name in the hat because I can create that impact. And that's the reason why I ran is because I wanted to be able to create the impact, the positive impact for families like mine and for single moms like me, for DV survivors, for all those who are on the margins, right? Who continue to be on the margins. And uh, when I told my mom that I was running, she even said to me, and this was super powerful for me. She, uh, she said, well, do you believe that anybody will vote for you? You're a single mom and you don't have a husband. Like, I don't think they would vote for you. And I said to her, but mom, that's why they would vote for me because they're gonna see me as strong. And so she went to her room, came back out and gave me $200. And I said, um, I can't take your money because you know, like I buy your groceries. And she said, uh, and she cried and she said, you know, in this world as, as your mother, I, can't, I couldn't give you too much. I couldn't give you a lot. But like, if you don't take my $200, like, what does it mean as a mother to me? Like, I'm supposed to do this. Like, let me invest in you. And so that's when I learned, like, who am I to tell anybody how to invest, you know, in, in their empowerment, in their voice? Because, you know, giving the $200 or $20 or $10 to my campaign makes me fight harder because I know those are the people that I'm fighting for. Those are the voices that I'm bringing to the table. That's the point of view I'm bringing to the table. And so it was just a huge game changer in that way and then it made me feel like actually this is the people see and I belong at this table. I'm going to try to refrain from crying it's just both of everything that you are saying is you know I, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of blown away by how much we share and how much our experiences overlap and that you know this is so important even for us as Asian American women from different backgrounds to come together to talk about our our issues and what we face. Both of you had talked about, you know, 
being uh, being homeless, uh, talked about some of the types of violence that we face. Um, we talked about, you know, being refugee. I want to turn our attention to what's been happening recently. So Stop AAPI Hate, an organization that was launched during the pandemic, had started recording anti-Asian hate incidents. And according to the, their data, um, over 60% of those incidents affected AAPI women. 60%. And every day lately, as I you know wake up to read the news and the headlines now are starting to be very clear on uh, some of these incidents that affect Asian women, you know, I think for me, at, at least my generation, I hadn't quite really grasped how much of this had been going on. And so the question to both of you is, you know, some people are asking, how did we get here? I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, yeah, how, how exactly did we get here? We'll start with Dr. One. Ooh, how did we get here? Um, it's, a, it's an important question, um, but first I wanna say thank you to Shang um, for recognizing me and AAPI Women Lead. And then also, of course, to share your survivor story. I think um, it's always very hard to tell um, anyone uh, what you've been through and uh, let alone tell your survivor story. So I wanted to say thank you, Shang, um, for doing that. Uh, and thank you for your leadership because it's not easy out in this world. Um, so keep going. There's that. Uh, and then to the point of how did we get here for 60%? You know, uh, to be honest with you, the numbers are greater than that, right? Uh, and that, that I say that because for AAPI Women Lead, we actually have an expansive and more layered, I would say, um, definition of what constitutes violence against our communities. Right. I think um, understanding these interpersonal incidents of violence that are Instagrammable or social media postable um, is has helped to raise a lot of attention around the violence against our communities. But those numbers don't account for um, the stories that Shang and I are telling you. Right. When AAPI Women Lead uh, launched a preliminary study about four and a half years ago, we were doing a study on the intersections of race and gender violence against Asians, uh, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. We were at the United States of Women Conference in LA. And mind you, it was a survey. And there were probably 50 people in line to take a survey because no one had asked them, what is the type of violence or what are your experiences? When we collected that data and then compared it to other organizations that we work with who are working to end racial and gender violence, we found that about 80%, so 40 to 80% of Asian Pacific Islander, not Native Hawaiian women um, have experienced some form of racial and gender-based harassment in their lives. That includes stalking, that includes domestic violence, that includes sexual violence, that in, and that doesn't include actually child sexual abuse, right? These numbers are huge. And so the, the data that we are collecting now um, is reflective, but it still doesn't get to the longstanding histories of violence that we've experienced. At AAPI Women Lead, we also understand the longer standing history of colonial violence as racial and gender-based violence, right? Shang and I, council member Shang and I both talked about being children of refugees. So for us at AAPI Women Lead, the colonial wars against Southeast Asia is also racial violence, right? It's also gender-based violence. On the day of the Atlanta area shootings in March 16th of last year, right? Where eight people were shot and killed six of whom were Asian um, women, many of whom were migrant workers, sex workers. That anniversary was also the anniversary of the My Lai massacre in the war uh, in Vietnam, where hundreds of Asian women and children were also shot, assaulted, and killed. 
So this is a longer standing history of racial violence and patriarchal gender-based violence against our communities. Uh, we count that at API Women Lead as a part of our history of violence, right? We're also talking about, you know, the uh, institutional violence that our communities have experienced, right? We talk about detentions and deportations where President Biden, um, you know, on the day that he announced that he was against hate violence against our communities, that day, 33 Vietnamese people were deported right? Deportation to us is also racial violence. I think uh, the lack of access to education is also violence. I think the lack of access to health care, uh, many of our community members, my mother in particular, right, um, has been misdiagnosed for many years, which inevitably led to her kidney failure, which inevitably led to my sister donating her kidney to our mom just about three months ago. Uh, the need for us to have to do that is also about racial violence. The fact that my sister had to come in and donate her kidney to our mom, uh, I think is our community coming in to support where I think the government has failed us. And that is a form of racial violence. I think the fact that, you know, I mentioned before we're Vietnamese, when we were at the doctor's office, they said, we don't have Vietnamese translation, but we have Cantonese. And I had to sit there and bite my tongue because I knew that my mother's life was in their hands. And I had to calmly say, um, it's not the same. And so they said, well, can you translate, right? To me, that lack of access to language services, that lack of access to empathy is racial violence and patriarchal violence, right? So this is longstanding and we haven't even calculated or have enough data around those forms of violence, right? We're talking about survivors of domestic violence who are now incarcerated, right? Uh, AAP Women Lead is hosting a mutual aid fundraiser for a Korean survivor of domestic violence who um, was formerly incarcerated uh, because she doesn't have support. And we're working with an organization called Survived and Punished to do this. Um, that her experience, right, is racial and gender violence. And the fact that most of this nation doesn't know her story well enough or how we got to her story is a part of the racial and gender violence, right? And then when we think about, you know, our workplace, right, I mentioned to you about my sister's experience that isn't factored into the 60% that you just mentioned. Um, that is a part of the violence, right? I haven't even talked about what it's like to walk on the street where someone randomly on chi in Chinatown just months ago said to me, um, do you give massages? That's not calculated in the data. So I think it's the legacy of violence against us and the invisibilization of that legacy, right? That has led us to this point by which we are so desperate enough to say we are done. We are done with the violence and we will continue to resist it and you will see us, right? And you will stop that violence and you will support our leadership, right? You will support Michelle Miao's show. You will support council member Shang Tao. You will support AAPI Women Lead because that violence against us is your responsibility and it's our responsibility to end it. So I would say that's, that's what led us and that's what we're doing about that. Council Member Tao. Yes, yes to all that. I'm gonna put, I'm, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> like in my head, I was doing this like, yes. Um, absolutely right. I mean, we are the invisible minority, you know? And so we need to truly, um, you know, continue to fight to disaggregate the data. You know, uh, Dr. Wen and I, we are Southeast Asian sisters. And uh, we know that, you know, our trials and tribulations are so much more different, you know? Um, than others. And so uh, I think that this aggregating this information is going to be key as a first start, you know, uh, and that's how, you know, how do we get here? That's a part of that too, right? You clump a group together and then you say you've done it. And then you, you say, okay, well, then now you don't have access to these resources because like together you're whole, right? But that's not, you know, but when you kind of break that apart and tease it apart, you realize that there's a lot of broken pieces, right? There are groups of people who are being left behind systemically, 
systemically. And, um, and this is going to carry on for generations. This, is, this means that for many generations to come, it's just not taking from one person or one family. It's for generations to come. And I truly believe that that is uh, the fight in which regards to when we talk about representation matters, you know, to really truly have a voice to really say, hey, I'm calling it out for what it is. And, um, and so just so that, you know, any families can have those opportunities as well. I'm wearing pink today because I'm a huge champion of access to abortion rights. And we're seeing, you know, with Roe v. Wade, you know, the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade, protections for women, we're going backwards. It's crazy because for me, you know, and this is only to me the second time I've, sta I've stated this out loud, but, you know, I was sexually assaulted and going back to the gender-based violence, by my abusive partner. He wanted to impregnate me to, you know, and I didn't want to have his baby. And so I had to go, I, I utilized Planned Parenthood and I um, lied to him to say I had a miscarriage because I didn't want to get beat up. And so, you know, when, when we talk about how do we get here, it's also uh, within not just the culture, but really understanding that there is, under reporting. I have never reported how many times I've been hit. I have never reported that I was sexually uh, assaulted, you know, because who would believe me is how I felt about it. Many women feel that way. And the stigma that, that you hold with you. And it's hard, and I'll be very honest, it's hard for me to say that to this day, and this is why I have not said it, but I understand that if I say it, it will empower other women. We need to just destigmatize all of that because it's happening off too off, uh, often. And so these statistics are not real. They're not, they're not accurate. You know, um, growing up, uh, we were, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood and, um, you know, we were called chinks and people robbed us and there was no reporting that was done. The sh everybody knew who did it to us. It was just our neighbors. And then the sheriff would come and say, it's the same sheriff. He'd come and say, I'll go talk to them. I'll go talk to them. So even if we call the cops, so that taught me at a young age that if you call the cops, they come and they're gonna take care of it by going to have a conversation. So no, there's no consequences. You can break into our, my vehicle, steal my stuff, steal my uh, traditional clothes, have your kids wear it out and play in the front yard, our traditional clothes. And when we called and uh, called, you know, officers, people who are supposed to enforce the law and say, hey, they stole our traditional clothes and they're wearing it. Um, and they stole it from our car and they broke into the car. It, nothing happens. And so when you grow up with that kind of, um, you know, uh, response from what the government should be helping with, then you become jaded. And there's no way that I was going to call the cops because I might get arrested. Going back to what Dr. Kanye Wan say, you know, who knows what my abuser is going to tell the cops? Will he believe me? Will she believe me? I don't know. And so these are all, you know, a part of like going back to the number of the underreporting and not just that, but it's um, the how women, how API women are just hypersexualized to this day, hypersexualized. Um, being an API woman, you know, in these political rooms, I mean, I'm kind of like a unicorn, right? And being a young API woman, you're treated a lot different. Men come a lot closer. You know, you don't take meetings after 5 p.m. Like, th these are all crazy things that, like, I shouldn't need to worry about as a professional, as a leader of the city. But I do because of all of this, um, you know, uh, hypersexual, sexualized uh, narratives that we receive uh, within society. And not just that, but us as seeing meek and what have you, you know, like in certain conversation, I have to curse just to show that I'm not meek, right? Just to show that I am serious, just to show that I can be a leader, just like my counterpart, um, you know, just like uh, Caucasian women, just like our African, uh, African American women, you know, and so it's, it's, it's a, when we talk about that number, it, it's, it, it happens in a lot of ways because not a lot of people can take that. And so then it, it takes them and makes them take a back seat when it comes to these leadership positions because that's abuse in itself. That's emotional abuse in itself. I'm just now realizing how much of uh, my life, even as a queer Asian or API woman, um, is so violent. 
and a lot of things that I never even talked about just be, and I didn't categorize it as violent but or violence I should say um, and then also that gets doubled because my partner is a woman as well uh, not even you know seeing like how their lives are affected or my partner's lives have been affected so thank you both um, so much for sharing and for getting us to this point where okay, this can't be, this can't be the future of our life, as Dr. Wan had said, you know, enough, right, in terms of the violence. Um, I want to go back to what Dr. Wan had, had mentioned in terms of racialized violence, like, not even, uh, for many of us, you know, we kind of, especially for our parents, we write it down in our history books as if this is just how it is for refugees, or for immigrants, or for Asian people, or for people of color, um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of, you know, racism and how we talk about racism and how it does affect all of our communities, by the way, especially, you know, our communities of color, and that the systemic racism is indeed, you know, the force behind what continues to oppress us. That is the power, that is the evil power, um, right, that keeps this machine going in which most of our life is violent. Uh, and so I'll, I'll start with Dr. One. That's a, a, uh, a rough question. <laughs> um, it truly is. And, and the reason why I'm so, you know, I really want to talk about it is because I'm seeing, when I look outside my window, I live in downtown Oakland, and I look outside my window, I see trauma. And I see our communities, you know, ruined by these systems. And then I see us being pitted against one another, being divided because of this thing called racism, you are both at the forefront of tackling, you know, these issues and you have some of the, the tools to work with communities to talk about, like, you know, there's this bigger evil force and it, we're better off united in fighting it than we are fighting each other. So I, I guess that kind of sets it up a little bit better than to have you go through all the, the challenging layers of this conversation. Could it, could, it can go on for hours and it probably, you know, should be another program. Um, and it should be, but <laughs> importantly, right. And that's me saying, Michelle, go ahead, do another program. On that one. Um, but I, a couple of thoughts is one, you know, my family is, is uh, from Oakland by way of Vietnam. So I completely understand what you're saying, Michelle. Um, what hurts me a lot I grew up running around the streets of Oakland Chinatown, and um, it's really heartbreaking to see what um, how Oakland um, looks today. And I say that because of all the de like the the gentrification that's taking place. That hurts our community a lot, and this is happening in predominantly communities of color. Right. Um, you know, I think about Oakland Chinatown and how our businesses have been divested from. Um, and instead of building a robust Oakland Chinatown like I grew up with, you know, I tell my partner all the time and I'm also queer. I tell my partner all the time, like it was so fun and you would always be running into people on the streets. And now it's like quiet and buildings are boarded up. And I'm like, how why are our community is not being supported, right? Why are we not being invested in? And instead there are, you know, um, investments in policing. Like I see empty police cars and I'm like, how is that helpful when we should actually have blooming businesses and people walking around and being excited to support one another and to build community in the way that Shang is talking about, right? So I think about that um, and, I, and I bring up gentrification and I bring up displacement really because of, your term and what you're calling racism, right? Which is a fact. I think that communities of color, black, indigenous, communities of color, immigrants, um, refugees, we are survivors of legacies and generations of racial violence, right? And I mentioned this earlier um, from when in Vietnam as an example, only as an example, right? We because the Philippines was impacted similarly. We're talking about, um, you know, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Japan, Korea, all the ways 
China, the ways in which we have been otherwise and deemed either evil or um, traitors or savages, right? There's a long history of the ways that white America in particular has otherized us as animals. In that way, they've been able to justify um, nation state, military spending, war. They've been, they, the powers that be, have been able to justify our deaths and our suffering, both in foreign policy and domestic policy, right? So I see a strong connection between the wars that I mentioned and what I just said and characterized of Chinatown, right? But I also want to add real briefly um, the intersections of race and gender. Um, and sexuality, right? Because as Michelle and I are saying, we operate and live at the intersections of these uh, marginalized identities. And I think that matters. So often we talk about racial violence, but very rarely do we say racial and gender violence. Very rarely do we say racial, gender, and violence against our queer communities, right? Because that means that we've experienced violence at multiple levels, from multiple vectors, from various institutions and policies and practices, right? And I think that's important because I don't think it's coincidental that when we talked about that incident in, in um, uh, not the incident, but the killings in Atlanta, that they targeted women. More recently in Dallas, targeted women, right? Um, in Vietnam, My Lai massacre, women. So I think these are really important things that we have to have conversations about together. Shang is mentioning her herself as a survivor of both racial and gender-based violence. So when we talk about race, we should also talk about gender, especially for communities of color. I think that's really important. Um, and the, the concept of intersectionality, I definitely wanna say, is from Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who is a Black feminist legal scholar uh, who helped us to understand the intersections of violence that our communities are experiencing. And as I said again, that's a whole legacy, right? Um, and I thank you all for bringing up your own survivor narratives from these multiple marginalities. Did you want me to remember Cal? Yeah. yeah. Um, Every time Dr. Lynn speaks, I'm just like, yes. Um, you know, I, I think going just uh, to carry on that same spirit, it's this whole idea of they're coming, you know, our, our otherness, right? They're coming for, for your resources. You know, they're going to come for your, um, your uh, storefronts. They're going to come for, you know, your college position seats or whatever have you. And I think that um, it's the whole idea of divide and conquer, right? And so the question around, like, how do I talk about racism is that, you know, we have so much more in common than we do, in diff uh, that we do different, right? Uh, we meaning people of color. Um, you know, we have exclusion in our history, we have trauma from white supremacy, we have trauma from lack of resources, and what happens is that, um, you know, white America pits us against each other. You put a bunch of people who have lack of resources because you refuse to give them the resources they need, and then um, they're going to fight to feed their kids and their babies, and I will tell you, as a single mom who was on uh, welfare and what have you, I was going to do whatever I needed to do to feed my son. And so this is just being a parent and trying to survive because we're lacking the resources that we need to survive. And so to say that somehow because this person has come into the community to harm uh, one of the community members in that community, how that becomes uh, a race thing. I, I think that a lot of times politicians too do politicize that for their own gain. And I think it's disgusting uh, when we all know that the root causes of all that is poverty, right? And so for me, investing in our most marginalized groups and investing in violence preventions and violence interrupters has been key. And I have been vilified for that myself and my other for progressive um, votes on the city council. There's five of us who voted for a more progressive budget that actually took $18 million and historically invested that into violence uh, prevention and violence interrupters, which makes sense because would it, wouldn't you want to prevent the violence from happening? Wouldn't you want to interrupt the violence before it happens? Because let's be very clear that officers respond to the violence, but if you can prevent it, 
then it's a safer space. If you can build community and invest in the forefront, that's better, right? And so investing in our, our young people, investing in our uh, foster youth, you know? And so I truly believe that, so that's how I talk about racism in, in my API communities and not just API, but within the Hmong community as well too, because it's so easy for people to see the news or watch social media and see different groups being pitted against each other. And then say that that's the reason why it's them, it's them. But when in all reality, you know, this, and then that gets passed down to, into different generations too, right? That view of that it's them. But when we talk to each other, because we are not taught in school all of our struggles, I truly believe, and I want to fight for this, that if we talked about our struggles from all different corners of the world, right? How did Hmong people get here? How did the Vietnamese get here? How did the Chinese get here? How did, you know, African Americans get here? How did our Latinx communities get here? That we see that there is parallel tracks and there are overlapping tracks that shows that white supremacy has gone far and beyond to keep us pushed down fighting against each other. And we have way more in common than we do differences. And this is actually the root cause of what racism is, is allowing for those institutions and those platforms to continue. And breaking them down is going to be very hard. You know, as a politician, I would tell you that because you have to appease a whole city, right? And so chipping at the ice block is incredibly important. It's hard work. It's, but you have to be intentional and you have to have strong partners like Dr. Connie Wan, the work that you do and other organization who keeps pushing you, right? As a politician, I may not be able to do 100% of the change overnight, but I'm pushing towards that. And, um, but that means that the people on the ground, the organization, they need to push for that 100% so that I keep moving forward as well too and keep pushing and uh, putting political pressure upon all of elected officials so that we can move forward in that way and not regress. Thank you both so much. Now, this is a word that I feel has become kind of a buzzword, especially on social media, and that word is solidarity. And there are spaces in which I walk into in which you know um, events, campaigns will say, we're standing in solidarity. Uh, that sometimes confuses me because I'm not really sure what we're doing that is in solidarity, <laughs> you know, when it's, when it just becomes that buzzword. So I'd love to hear from both of you what, it, what solidarity actually looks like, what it feels like, what it is, you know, for you when you are actively doing the work. Dr. One. Oh, yeah, I actually really appreciate you saying it. it's a buzzword, um, because pretty soon we'll see it on a commercial. Um, and our organization has been talking about this quite a bit. Um, and I think, you know, for us, uh, solidarity is a practice, right? And for AAPI Women Lead, solidarity for us means actively working together to dismantle systems, cultures, policies, practices that have been um, too long in acting and enabling violence against our communities. Uh, and I'll say that again, right? Uh, solidarity for us means working together to dismantle systems, cultures, policies, practices that have enabled and enacted, especially racial and gender violence against our communities. So I think of solidarity as us in a couple of ways. One is to recognize both the privileges and resources that people come with, right? I'm often a fan of taking inventory, practically speaking, take inventory of the resources and the, um, again, the um, privileges that we embody and have. For me, as a pretty, you know, cis, cis um, gendered, pretty high femme appearing person that comes with some advantages, I'll have to say, right? Um, and I count that as an example of potential privileges and resources. Uh, I think I have a PhD that too comes with privileges and resources. That's an example. I think about me living by the lake in Oakland as a potential privilege and resource. And I also think about what that means in relationship 
to my counterparts, and that includes Black, Indigenous, uh, recent refugees, um, unhoused communities, uh, my trans uh, sisters and siblings, um, non-binary communities, right? What do these privileges and resources mean in relationship to others who are in, who I am in community with or who I purport to be in solidarity with, right? So that would be number two. Think about uh, solidarity in terms of a relationship, right? So how do I utilize my resources in order to support um, communities um, who have been too long marginalized, uh, disenfranchised, and extracted from, right? So I think of it in, in, the, in this way. And then I think of it in terms of if, again, the objective is to dismantle the systems, right, um, practices and culture, then I want to utilize my resources in relationship to my counterparts such that we can dismantle the systems that have caused way too much violence. And in that, the objective is to create an entirely different world, right? I say that also because as an organization, we're an abolitionist organization, and that too has become a catchphrase. But abolition for us means recreating an entirely different world. It's not just about the police, it's about the criminal justice system, the schools, the medical industry, all of these systems that have caused so much violence have to actually go and something else has to take place. One that is another world that is supportive. Another world that cares about its counterparts, right? Another world that like fosters um, community, not tears apart community. Right. So I think of that in terms of solidarity. Uh, and I also, again, you know, at our AAPI Women Lead annual conferences where 300 people go, right, we are always talking about solidarity and what that means in practice. Uh, we had our hashtag Me Too co uh, founder, Tarana Burke, at the last event. We had Congresswoman Barbara Lee at another event. We had our indigenous leaders at another event. We had, uh, we amplified our native Hawaiian leaders, our Pacific Islander communities, largely because when we talk about API, we often forget our PIs. Right? We often forget our Native Hawaiians. So for us, as solidarity, we take the term AAPI and we make sure that everyone is included in that, right? And I, I, I brought up the conference because of course, I want everyone here to come to it. Um, and just to kind of share out that information before I forget, uh, visit, you know, imreadymovement.org backslash 2022, because we want you there and we want you to help us create a different world. I'll be there, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, Council Member Tao would love to hear, you know, solidarity with that actually looks like what that feels like for you yeah no absolutely solidarity in regards to the uh, political world to me looks like allowing for community stakeholders to be at the decision making table and being truly intentional when it comes to how we implement policy um, there are a lot of negative consequences if you are not intentional and if you don't have the right people at the table. And when I say right people, I'm not talking about people who have uh, paid to be at the table or who have done something for you at the table, but people who are going through the struggle, right? Truly going through the struggle to truly learn from their lived life experience. Uh, it's the same take that I took in regards to like why I wanted to run for the seat, right? I felt like there was no lived life experience um, in regards to the leadership at the current table. And so you know, I don't claim to understand or have even walked through the shoes of many different communities out there. And so for me, it's about listening. It's about being intentional about asking folks, what do you think, you know, can accomplish the goals that we're trying to accomplish? What do you feel like, um, you know, and then from there, it's about matchmaking for me, really. Uh, it's listening and then them telling me what my charge is. I'm a public servant. I work for you. Right, <laughs> so that's very key. I think public servants forget that a lot of the times, but I have always operated in that form and fashion. You know, even as a representative, as a council member, I always remind um, my constituents that you are the ones in power, and so I'm empowering you 
through you working collectively as a community in whatever issue areas that you are concerned about. And you come to me and give me direction on how I need to best advocate for you, because that's what I do. I am your vessel to advocate for you because I have a vote at the decision making table. I can pick up the phone and call people that you that may not, not pick up your phone call. And so that's truly how I see my role as a leader. And not just that, but when you are intentional in that way. And when you involve community in that way, you know, you don't carry all that weight on your shoulders on your own because then everyone comes to the table to find solutions with you. You cannot be the, you know, for me, it's, it's not about being the smartest person in the room. It's about bringing the creativity to the room because what we have been doing as an example, as we've seen on the streets today in Oakland is not working. <laughs> it's just not, right? And so when you are bringing new thought leaders into the room, bringing people who, you know, like those thought leaders, the new thought leaders will come up with these outside of the box ideas, ideas that not only are good, but that will work. And not only that will work, but will work for the community because you put it, you're putting the community voice in front of anything else. And, you know, maybe it's, and it's always trial and error, right? And if you error, then you all err together. Right. And then you learn from it and you move forward. And so for me, that's what solidarity looks like. That's what solidarity means to me. Um, I do believe that it's, uh, you know, uh, used a lot for it's a catchphrase. But, um, you know, that's just have been my intention. And I believe that it's true to my values of how, how I grew up. Um, even, you know, it, growing up and a lot of the uh, a part of the time growing up, we lived in public housing. And so during that time, I learned a lot, right? You, I learned from the streets. <laughs> and so when you learn from the streets, it's like what goes really far is respect, treating people with dignity, being honest, and not just that, but trying to create community. When you know your neighbors or when you know the people uh, at the parks or what have you, we that's the way we keep ourselves safe, right? That's how we keep ourselves safe, when we know each other. When, you know, when we can go ask uh, Joe next door and say, hey, 10 o'clock, I have an interview. Can you turn down your, you know, your radio? And so it's like basic stuff like that that doesn't need to end in harm, but that's like building community through your own community, right? And so it goes all the way down to the block by block. It's, you know, at every single level. We have about five minutes left and I'm down to my last couple of questions. Um, you know, this entire hour, you've already demonstrated the importance of a API women and leadership, why we have to be at the table and not just there, but also the decision makers, why we, you know, have to be at the forefront of, you know, doing uh, this type of work with our communities. Um, so I'd love to hear, you know, your, your final thoughts in terms of uh, what we envision for the future. We, we heard from both of you that, you know, we could make an entire new system that is safe for all of us. We don't have to hopefully operate, you know, in the underground economy. We don't have to live in situations in which we're in constant violence. We can create, you know, a, a, an entire new system. Maybe in just like, you know, maybe list two or three what that might look like in the future for you of say there were more Asian women leaders, um, give, us, give us a snapshot. We'll start with Dr. One. Ooh. So uh, I think I would say a couple of things. Um, you know, I'll have to be honest, I'm not a fan of sitting at the table because I feel like the table causes a lot of violence. So I'm often like, I don't want your table. I would like something entirely new. Let's sit on something else, a lot prettier, a lot more comfortable, nice seats. Do you guys wanna sit outside? Maybe not a table, right? So I say that because I honor the people who work very hard to be at the table. And I'm also a fan of saying this table is not working, right? And in that world, it looks like we're actually gathering together. We can gather and sit at, you know, a park together. We can gather and sit on the floor together. We can gather and sit and stand together, or we can do anything that our society deems is possible for as long as it's in community and taking care of one another. 
I think that's important, right? In the world that um, I envision and want to be made possible, I think that while there may or may not be people who are working in the informal economy, the objective is that we respect one another and we support one another. We don't destigmatize, we don't stigmatize rather. We don't stigmatize, we don't demonize, we definitely don't criminalize people who are operating at any level of the economy, especially if it's um, to take care of themselves and their community, right? Um, the idea that we wouldn't need an informal economy is super important. I think that's something that I really love about what you said, Michelle, right? Where people don't have to do, they don't have to do anything, right? <laughs> like you're not coerced to do anything. You are actually of choice. You have agency, right? To make decisions as you would like to make. You are free, right? Today is um, the birthday of Yuri Kochiyama Makamex. And I grew up learning from Yuri Kochiyama, flew to Harlem. She invited me to stay at her place, emailed me via AOL. And both of these are freedom fighters, right? And one of the things that Yuri was very adamant about was about being in solidarity and freeing our communities. She was about freeing people who were incarcerated. She was about freedom fighters. She was about supporting Black liberation. She was about supporting Puerto Rican movements. She was about supporting Asian American movements, right? For me in, in our ideal world, um, we are free. We're free and we're well. Uh, we would never put our people in cages. We have an anti-colonial framework where we do not colonize people, right? Um, or lands, we give people back their lands, their freedom, and we operate by choice. Right, so I'm 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 so excited about this question. I don't I'm like and there's flowers, right? Um, but there are no there's no state violence, there's no racial gender based violence. People get to be as queer as they want to be, right? <laughs> like in this world. And at that leadership gathering, there are trans folks, non-binary folks, survivors who are saying this is how. Survivors always know best, to Shang's point. We always know best the kind of world that we should all be living in. And that world listens to us as leaders, right? So I just wanna, I'm gonna keep mulling over that thought, but I hope you all, people who are listening, will come to the world that I'm talking about, because we would need you. And then um, finally, I mean, Council Member Tao, you've got, you're trying to fill some some shoes here so maybe it's a it's a new oakland right like you're running as mayor of oakland um so you're uh, let's join dr one with the flowers and a free world but talk to us about what a free oakland might look like yeah absolutely you know i i think it's um it's heartbreaking and devastating just to see how many people are unhoused because why because we chose to build market rate <laughs> I, mean, I just I, I laugh because it's dis, it's just, it's disgusting and it's it's just disappointing you know um we see in our arena numbers the arena numbers are the actual by law what we need to build and we are seeing that we are we the city of Oakland has built out past 100 percent of market rate and then they have we haven't even made a dent in regards to affordable deeply affordable or moderate housing and so the question becomes, what kind of Oakland are we building and for who? Because it ain't for me. I can tell you, I'm a renter. I'm one of two renters on the city council. And if I get evicted or whatever, like my partner loses his job, like I wouldn't be able to afford to live in the city that I'm running to become the mayor of. And that is very depressing because that is taking my agency away, taking my ability to represent a city that I feel strongly that I can represent and not just can but know how to right it's taking away the people that's making Oakland so beautiful and vibrant everyone's always talking about oh Oakland is so rich in culture well you're taking all that culture right by displacing everybody forced displacement you might as well call it imminent domain by gentrifiers you know and so 
that's what it is, right? Because when you have eminent domain, it's the government coming in to take your property for a better use. And I wouldn't say that this is a better use at all, but we are, you have to be very intentional. And so for me as a city council person, I've already am setting the seeds and going up, up against a lot of political uh, 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 chaos basically around how do we get more affordable, deeply affordable housing in the pipeline instead of market rate. And so, um, you know, but it's okay because I know how to do the matrix in city hall and I'm setting those seeds in place so that when I am Oakland's next mayor, I can start implementing because we need to build a, a deeply affordable housing. We need to build affordable housing, moderate housing, because we are have, we're having too many, of our brothers and sisters unhoused on the street and it's not okay. It's never going to be okay. We need to work with organizations that have strong track records that, and it's not just it, it, that are not just doing what a, 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 a creating a business model of having people come in for six months and then them leaving for six months and having them coming in because they're making a, a dollar out of it, right? You have to hold organizations accountable. Like what kind of work are you really doing? Are you really supporting those who are at, at the margins? Are you really getting, are you able to get people into a job if they need it? Are you able to get them a good credit score? How are you teaching them the financial literacy? Because that's all a part of it. Right. And so for me, it's all about going back to the basics. And I know what the basics is, because remember, I'm learning this, you know, in, in college. I mean, financial literacy is so incredibly important and we need to make sure that citywide, but not just that, but housing. How do we get people into housing and how do we teach them how to negotiate their leases? Right. How do we make sure that they're not getting con? And so running uh, for Oakland to be Oakland's next mayor, you know, as uh, the top three uh, serious candidates, I am the most progressive person running when you're looking at the top three candidates who are, um, are running in this race. And, you know, I have the most experience as well too. And it's just not life experience, but it's also experience at City Hall. And so it's about time for me. My, my North Star is always make City Hall work for the people, right? Because right now it doesn't, it doesn't at all. And uh, we're seeing a lot of families suffer because of that. A lot of people are taken away from the city that they grew up in, that have been living here for generations. You know, um, you know working with my colleagues on great things like a Black New Deal, you know, uh, reparations, you know, these are all things that I care deeply about. You know, it, I don't need to be the champion of everything. No, I'm not that person to be like, oh, me, 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 but I will support and I'll be your ally and I will follow your lead. And I think that's the kind of leader that Oakland needs right now is somebody who can bring everybody together, somebody who people will listen to. Yes, we don't agree on everything. We're not supposed to. I mean, like I'm a representative of many, many people. However, I can work with you and they, and you know that you can work with me. I will listen intently and try to figure out a pathway forward. And at the end of the day, I think that because we haven't had that in the city of Oakland, that our city has become stagnant and is being built for other people. And that's not okay. And I'm here to say that I'm here to make that, uh, to do a full on stop and to make sure that we, are putting our needs, our Oaklanders needs in the forefront, including making sure that our young people have jobs. And when I say young people, I mean all the way to like 30, 35. Okay, let's be very clear about that. It's just not 18, it doesn't stop there. And so, you know, and so it needs to good paying jobs, good paying jobs so they can afford to live here. And it, it doesn't make any sense that people have to live all the way in Stockton and then travel to Oakland to work here. It makes zero sense. And so creating financial stability and making sure people have housing, that's going to be key. And that's how we become in intentional and that's why we need new leadership quite honestly yes we need more aapi women leaders and so i thank you both so much for being on this program and for sharing your work and sharing your thoughts and sharing you so please support the work of aapi women lead and also find out more information about council member shang tao's campaign she's running for mayor of oakland and you can find all that stuff i'm sure on the world wide web Thank you both for being here with us at the Commonwealth Club of California. And thank you to all of you who've joined us this afternoon. You can head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all future programming. We'll see you next time right here at the Commonwealth Club of California.